So let's now talk about the protocol design and the impact. At the time, we had um, a huge interest in wireless mesh, right? And uh, wireless mesh was always you have a source, a destination, a number of nodes. Some of them you choose for re repeaters or recoders. And then you say, okay, give me a single pass. And the goal was to have a mesh. But mesh was really complicated, right? It did not work out as we wanted. Now, if you go upstairs, there's a group of people using Meshmerize, a new protocol to do exactly that, to find, hey, here could be a second pass. In the beginning, when you're an engineer and you cannot do what you, what you dream of, so on, on paper this would work nicely. But what we did is we said, okay, we cannot do this to control, to signal, all. it was too complicated at the time. So what we said is, when I sent from the source to the first relay, I ask one helper node. So I break down the whole mesh into something like direct pass, one helper, direct pass, one helper. And it gives good results. It's not the best. We are happy that we have something better now with Mesmerize. But at the time we said, let's only understand this problem of source, destination, helper. So then you have something like this. So the re relay recoder I, recoder or re uh, uh, repeater one pl I plus one, and then there's a helper node. And then you have always some epsilons here. And the only thing we want to understand, what should he do? It must be simple, right? You, you don't want to signal it. So, so what we will do is he will send something out and he could do one thing, what we did so far in the example, whenever um, I get a slot to transmit, I will send something recorded. So if the, me, if the medium access is you can send, you can send, you can send, you can send, which means he sent a packet, he sent a packet, he sent a packet, he sent a packet. And this led to these extra packets. Not good. So the easiest way was, I said, I wait, no, wait a minute. Whenever I receive a new packet, I will record it and send it out. So he sends something out. And when he gets something successfully received, he will also send something out. Why is this a good idea? Why is this better than this? Think about the rank of the information they have. So when, when he receives something and he, he is chosen as helper, he should have the better link here than this link, right? So he said, if I get something new, maybe it's worthwhile that I say it, right? In the worst case, he has heard it, but maybe he has not heard this and all the others because I take the new information and record it with others. So maybe he will be happy with that. So the likelihood of creating duplicates is reduced. Maybe, maybe, nobody knows that, right? The best thing that we could come up is a protocol, we, we call it um, playing cool. I don't know if you know what this means, playing cool, but you just stay cool. You don't send so much, but how much should you really send and when? So when you know these epsilons, you can theoretically calculate that you have a certain transmission rate here and here, so you know when to start your transmission here, and before that you just stay cool. It's like you being in the lecture. If you would run out after hearing about the butterfly, before I show you the green packets, and you run out and tell everybody about network coding, you're not a very useful recoder because you have not so much information. So you stay in the classroom and listen for a while, and then you send. But you need to the perfect starting time. Because if you send too late, then he was waiting for information here, and this was really bad. And then you send, and then um, it was too late. Maybe it was better before. So when to start to send, this only depends on epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and epsilon 3. Calculated. So what we did, we put some Raspberry Pis up, we did some Wi-Fi over here, we Put, put the antenna away, we really looked at the packets, we destroyed them with certain deterministic error rates. So here's 20% success rate, 50% and 70%. Okay? And then we look at the, at the duplicates that are coming in. There were 100 packets and we said, okay, what is the likelihood going over the degrees of freedom for the, um, for the 100 packets? And here you see something, this is over the packets, how much extra packets you 
What is the chance of creating uh, linear dependencies? And here the same. What is the difference? This is binary and this is 2 to the 8. And what is the difference between the two? Can you spot it? It's in the end. This one is missing here. More or less, this is the same height, but this is here in the end, and I hope that you understand what this is. The 1.6 that I talked to you about, that kicks in here. And you see also where the linear dependency comes. It comes from the helper, or helper in the source, the blue ones that you don't see here, right? So here the, um, the source never sent something linear dependent. Here he did it. The blue one is, little, is less because only 20% goes through. But here you see this one is the code inefficiency. But the code inefficiency has, was nothing compared to the overall dependency because we sent too much. Because here, what was the policy? Agnostic recoding. That is what you saw before. This is what happened here. Okay? Therefore, here, no big difference. And this, it, the reason for that is exactly this compared to the other one is negligible. So let's now change the policy from agnostic recoding to say you only send something if you get something new. And now we have to look carefully. Click. So we improve the situation. So creating duplicates shrink by half. Still, you have this one here, right? Good. Now we say, okay, then let's do playing cool. Playing cool now says, I listen for a certain while and then don't do anything, for example, for the first 40% of the time. And then I start. It depends only on the epsilons. And now what you see? 3% here and 1% here. So this is still, did we start at the right time? You can argue about this. You can get away with that, then you start a little bit later, but then you pay in latency. Okay, 1% is not bad. We wanted to have 64 time slots, now we have 64.6. But we even could decrease it. This one is theory, by the way. Even though we did code all the stuff, the error rates were deterministic and we knew, knew them. So it's not really a good one. We need something more adaptive because in real networks, the error rate will change over time. So you cannot really calculate when should you start to send. You can have some thumb rules, maybe, right? To say, never start in the first 33% of the time, right? Otherwise, you would not have chosen as a relay, right? You have a good link. And then when the link quality on information is inaccurate or not stable over runtime, hmm, what are we doing then? Um, if the link quality information is not always available, so if we just have to, to live with what the decoder will tell us, right? Then we, sometimes maybe the decoder has to broadcast from time to time some information to say, uh, duplicates, right? It's like Homer Simpson that is always shouting in his house, boring, right? This is exactly what the decoder should do from time to time to tell me, oh, I'm talking too much. Now, retrieving the link quality information increase um, the overhead, that is also clear. The waiting time as um, the recoder um, is also to get, to get the knowledge, must be adaptive, and then we need a feedback, right? an update value somehow. I will not tell you how we did it, there's the paper if you are interested in that. What we did at the time, we had this Raspberry Pis with the nice dongles, we put them in different rooms in Aarburg University, distance 30 meters, here's the source, here's the helper. Right? Why is this a good helper? Because this was direct line of sight because we had the window. This was a little bit hidden, right? And the walls here is just paper. It's a university that cracks down the walls if they need the space. They're doing this quite nicely. So if you have this test bed and um, you look at the, the real measurements, right? The effect of the number of training generations. So we are training it now. We are sending and we're looking how much linear dependency you have. When the training generations is low, then you see how uh, we have a lot of we make mistakes.
But as we can learn over the training generations, then, so you're 64, pa uh, 64 packets of generation. You do it once, you have a little bit of overhead. You do it again, and then you decrease it. Well, after you've done it 10 times, you go down dramatically, okay? And um, the updating value, when we have, to, when the, uh, the decoder should shout sometimes, um, is also the impact. Here you see there's an optimal point. And if you do more, it gets worse. I mean, that you decrease it significantly, that when you learn something about it, it's clear. But this is the impact when you make it worse, because your own signaling makes it worse, okay? Um, I think this is not the one. What I would like to show you now is, this is the same plot for the realistic one. And what do you see here? This is, um, again, the binary one, and this is the um, higher field. And you see here, he did something, he tried something out, here came updates, and he shrinked it down. And then towards the end, he increased it. But this is also, the 1.6 is more here. He tried to say, okay, I don't care. Now it's, it's the end, we, let's finish it. There is some duplicates, I don't give a shit. I just send out the packets, okay? If you do the same with a, a higher field, then he, you see, he tried something out here, was, had even more impact than over there. He learned about this, and then he always came back. So it's not going down to zero. He always wanted to say, I'm, doing, I'm risking a little bit, so to speak. But overall, the sum is only 1% overhead here. But this is a realistic protocol. This is a real measurement. This is a real test bed. So let's assume even it's 1%. Let's say it's 65. Then I have one packet more than the optimal that I could get out. I think that is quite interesting for us. Okay? So that's the one theory and practice difference. Not only coding. Coding is, is one part of the story. But we are here for communication networks, so protocols, they matter. And this is something that we should really always have in mind. It's not only the, the uh, coding as it's done. And Kodo helps you to take all the information theoretical approaches away from you. You just have to tell them how to code. But the real work as an engineer is now to find out the protocols. And this is what we do at the chair most of the time.